<laughs> well, uh, uh, so Chris is going to talk to us um, from his uh, fairly new role at JLL, so real estate, big real estate company. John Lang Lasalle, sounds French as well. Must be French. No? Oh, well. And our second speaker, Prina, who's on, online. Uh, so she's a CRM ambassador from Telstra. So without ado, we're going to start the presentations and the proceedings. And I'm going to hand over to um, Chris. Take it over. Thanks, Greg. This is going to be interesting because I'm trying to get there we go straight away. Here we go. So I want to obviously try and face face everyone, face the camera, and look at my slides. Cables. <laughs> cables, cables, cables everywhere. Right. So normally I like to stand up and present, but obviously today. Do you want to click on the on button? No, no, no. It's okay. That's okay. Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks, Fred, for inviting me. Um, my name's Chris Curtis. I'm just going to adjust this a little bit more. Um, and so, in my career, I've I've worked in some pretty large companies, um, mainly analytical and BI type roles, moving in and managing teams that have obviously been using Tableau. So, today I'm going to talk to you about building data products, uh, and this is thinking differently about dashboard creation. I wanted to share some of my learnings um, and why I started to think a little bit differently about data and dashboard creation. So just a little bit about, little bit about me to start with. Um, I am originally from Brisbane, but I moved to London in 2006. So I've actually been away from Brisbane for a long time, um, 15 years in the UK. And uh, my wife is British and we decided to relocate back to Brisbane last year, all the pandemic and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, wanted to come back here with the weather and a bit of sort of space and lifestyle. Um, so got a very young family, but, you know, fortunate with um, being able to work with a, a different variety of organizations, um, each at different stages of growth and maturity. And, and this has helped me gain a really deep understanding of um, how data could and should be used within these organizations. So as Fred mentioned, I'm working for Jones Lane LaSalle. Um, we've got Gary here as well. I think Darren might be online. So uh, a couple of other sort of people involved from the company and, and also involved in the Tableau community here. So my role, um, Global BI Technology Director, it sounds quite fancy, but it's actually not that exciting. Um, and the primary purpose of my role is to focus on how our teams use a lot of the analytical tools that we have at our disposal. So what that means is that we're making sure that we use these tools in a responsible, responsible way. We know that some of these tools cost a lot of money. And uh, if we're only using like 20, 30% of their capability, we wanna make sure that we're trying to maximize the value of that spend. So, don't want to touch it. <laughs> so the three main things that I focus on in my role, um, protecting our existing assets. So these are like Tableau server and we use Alteryx um, and our database environments. Um, also innovation, discovering what kind of other tools are out there that we can you know, add to our, uh, add to our suite, making sure that we're delivering the insight to the business. Um, and also like partnering with our IT and platform owners, so making sure that they understand what our needs are, uh, making sure those environments are sort of suited and, and giving us the best, uh, best experience for, for our stakeholders. So, the main things I wanted to talk to you today um, and the, the key things to take away is that um, I think BI and data is, is changing. Uh, it's no longer considered like an independent element within an organization. Data is, data is now feeding like models, um, you know, recommendation engines, CRM sort of uh, mailing lists, all this kind of stuff. It's becoming more and more mature. And this means that as BI and data professionals, we need to really learn and adapt from some of the operational processes from, from the IT side of things and making sure that these things don't break. 
because when they do break, it, we lose money. Um, they become such an important part of, the, of you know, how businesses operate now. So the, the next thing is around simplification. So as obviously data becomes more ingrained in the organizations, um, it's, it's being reached to more and more people. Um, they can't ignore data anymore. It's, it's kind of like in their face. And so businesses are expecting people to, to use data in everyday roles to make these decisions. And it's our goal to make sure that this shift is as easy as possible. If people don't understand where data comes from, then in it, how it gets to them, there can be some sort of unrealistic expectations. You know, data just suddenly appears and it's all nice and clean for them to, to use. So you know, helping get them a, a getting a good understanding of what processes actually go through for data to be, you know, coming in and made available for them. And, and then the third thing is around the tools. And so we're, we're quite lucky that um, there's already a lot of ways that we can uh, make some of these changes that I'm talking about, going to be talking about. Uh, a lot of these things already exist in Tableau. Um, so I'm just going to share some of the things that, that I've sort of learned along my way. Um, and hopefully that they're not all unknown to you and, um, and share some other people that maybe you can try something new and, and see how we can incorporate these kind of things in. So I'm going to share some tips which can help us on this journey to go from dashboards to data products. So when working at uh, my previous companies, uh, there was a bit of a common theme. Um, both of these type of organizations had very immature uh, BI functions. They were uh, very similar in terms of how the business perceived the teams. Uh, and it was more like a data vending machine, you know, requests come in and dashboards came out type thing. Uh, a lot of times dashboards were just kind of given to people and then after a while they just become discarded and just, you know, sitting, sitting there is kind of like technical debt, just sitting on servers and, you know, hitting the database and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of the time each, each of these business units uh, had an analyst assigned to them. So it was very much kind of reactive type requests that were coming through. Um, and this also meant that a lot of other parts of the business just did not have any kind of support from, from data. So like some of the more... Uh, you know, non-traditional kind of data areas like HR and legal and procurement, these type of functions just didn't have any support because they didn't fund any sort of analyst resource. So a lot of time we found that um, requests weren't triaged, they weren't prioritised. It was a lot of like whoever shouted loudest got, got the sort of the, um, the outcome. And there was no real collaboration amongst the analytical, uh, analytical teams. Um, so a lot of times the requests were very similar between sales and marketing and duplication of effort was occurring. Um, so what I found that when moving into um, these organizations started to evolve into you know, data, what, we, what I call data organizations. So moving from like a BI team to now becoming more of a data organization. The first thing that changed was the appointment of like a CDO type role. Um, and these people would go off into the business, kind of act as chief cheerleaders um, and really build the relationship from the top down and selling, selling the, the value of what data is and why it's important and why the business should invest in it more. Um, you know, hire more people, you know, the infrastructure and all these kind of like tech stacks, which are obviously super expensive. Um, a lot of the time they also helped highlighting some of the issues and challenges and stuff like that. So at, the, at my last company, I actually saw the biggest evolution from 50, a team of 15, which actually grew in grew to 80 plus analysts in, in two years. Uh, if you add the sort of engineering space as well, it's probably another, another 80 of that as well. So 150 people in total, which was a huge amount of growth in such a short amount of time. Um, other elements which allowed some of this transformation is enabling the business to understand what's actually possible selling the vision, but also removing the barriers. Uh, this was driven a lot by self-service, self-service analytics. It's, it's you know, quite a, um, a hot topic at the moment as well. Uh, this, this was pushed out into the business. It was, instead of being like us versus them, um, we invited business users into, you know, work more collaboratively. Uh, data was no longer an IT black box type uh, practice. Tickets were just submitted and, and reports produced. So more collaboration, more targeted insight, and this was delivered because the business was more informed. 
Um, they were able to sort of like do their own sort of investigations and then actually come to the, the data functions with a little bit more um, in a context in terms of what they're actually trying to do and trying to solve. This also benefited the analysts because they were not just getting the same old questions coming through, they actually were doing work that was focused on strategic initiatives. Um, so, you know, a lot of these kind of changes were was around like how data was branded in the business. Um, one of the things is like data was seen as mysterious and complicated and, and too technical. Um, and by one of what I've saw done well was people sort of simplifying like what data is and, and how the business can benefit from, from it. And that's where we sort of start to get to this kind of like adoption of like product concepts. Um, one of the things that we, we introduced was this concept of data products. We had consumers of data, um, they had specific needs, desires. Um, and the issue was that it was is difficult or impossible to create like a unique solution for everybody. And, you know, I like to use these analogies where that's why tailor-made suits are so expensive is because you're, you're creating like really bespoke sort of output for that type of customer. We can look at Cadbury's chocolate, you know, there's there's the sort of the one core in a bunch of ingredients, but multiple different things that come out of it. The flavors still, you know, different flavors, but the main manufacturing process is, is the same. And so we kind of like adopted this um, data product mentality. Um, and what we did was we kind of like introduced these definitions of what a data product was. Uh, a data product is a pipeline um, or components of a pipeline that take raw data and turn it into insights or automated decisions. And so what we started to talk about was how, you know, the outcome of a data product could be a Tableau dashboard. So we talked about this evolution of, of BI functions into data organization. One of the key things was the simplification of data. And you can see here, this was the, the, the chief data officer at the time. He, he just took this around the business and, and really sort of um, highlighted how actually when you look at it, it's actually quite simple because you're accessing data to bring it in from different systems. Uh, you're transforming it, making it usable, and then you're delivering it back into the business. We deliver through, you know, visualizations such as Tableau. So that was the kind of uh, the area that I played in was the whole delivery piece. I had a team of um, developers who were building Tableau dashboards. I was um, running the Tableau server. Um, and now at JLL, I kind of like help advise like how the best ways we can use Tableau um, and make sure that we're using the, the, the product in an efficient way. When I saw this, it, it really resonated with me. Um, I felt it was like a great way to sort of like highlight the value of what we did to people who would tend to be a little bit more resistant and scared when you started talking about data and you know ETL pipelines and all this kind of stuff. So uh, I think it's more important to, to recognize that um, when we look at this, the delivery piece is much more, is, is visible to the business. They see the dashboards, they see the charts, they see this kind of stuff. What they don't often see is the, the sort of the ingestion processes and the transformations that are taking, um, taking place behind the scenes. Um, and it's, I think there's been a recent, a lot of focus on DevOps and data ops as, as sort of like, um, you know, processes being introduced now. I think there's a lot of uh, good things that we can learn from that. Um, I've attended conferences before where people ask, where should data sit in an organization? And when people, uh, people say, definitely not in IT. And I'm kind of going like, hang on a minute, but IT have done all this stuff, you know, in terms of like uh, incident management and, and, and DevOps, they've done it well for years and years and years. And we're saying we don't want to be part of that, but I think there's a lot of learnings we can take from that. Um, so in, in that is, is try to educate and inform people that there's actually stuff that's, you know, under the surface there that needs to be made aware of. Um, but it's also important to have the right type of monitoring, alerting, incident management in place to make sure that that whole kind of um, process is, is, uh, is working properly. But that's not all here for today. So, you know, that's a completely different topic. So one of the reasons we're here tonight is we deliver BI through um, to the business through Tableau. And when we consider Tableau, uh, a Tableau dashboard as a data product, we can break down the product creation in three different stages, planning, development, and launch. Most BI teams have, you know, quite probably similar methodology. I've just consolidated a little bit from some of my previous experiences. Um, and I like this analogy of looking at it like a data assembly line. Um, we were joking at a previous company where, 
uh, we were too close to the factory floor as, as managers. Um, we were getting our hands dirty. We were you know, helping build stuff. Um, and what we needed to do be, was, was standing like supervisors, standing on the, um, you know, on the, on, up, up above everything and looking down and, and seeing where the bottlenecks were, seeing where things were, were getting held up and, and, and falling apart and making sure that we were shipping these you know, products off the assembly line out into, into our customers. So just to kind of cover off like, you know, these kind of things, like, you know, it shouldn't be sort of, this shouldn't be, you know, anything new to people here, but, you know, talking about the planning stage, you know, creating those requirements, getting those briefs in, people engage us when they need our help um, and they're trying to answer a question. So it's our job to be patient and, and really sort of help them talk through their problem and then we can solve it with data. Uh, prioritization. Uh, it's likely that there's going to be other requests um, for data products, and it's important to determine what's important um, and really dictate the priority based on like, a whole bunch of factors. Wireframing, uh, I think this is you know, important, and I know it's something that we're sort of like really keen on at, at JLL, um, taking the stakeholder on that journey and really sort of helping them you know, start to see what that prototype looks like in terms of that product creation. Um, you know, it helps gives a sense of what it's going to look like, but also help to determine what data structure is actually required there as well. Then there's the kind of like the whole walkthrough, taking engaging stakeholders, making sure that what, what's going to be built is actually what's going to meet their needs, uh, creating the technical specifications, detailed documents, which captures what's going to be built, um, and then getting that agreement from the stakeholder. You know, we're not just running off and, and building something before the consumer is actually going to say, yes, that's actually what I want. Then there's development, and this is, you know, obviously where the fun begins. Everyone wants to just rush off and start, you know, extracting data and, you know, writing code and, and you know, building sort of tableau charts and stuff like that. Um, and so we, we obviously go and explore. We, we check on the data that we're looking at. Um, we're building. We're doing data model models. We're doing some data prep, um, and we're making sure that these visualizations can be can be created. So. You know, the charts and dashboards are created based on the, um, the wireframing that was done. And then we work with the, the sort of stakeholders, almost like doing those kind of like customer focus groups and, and you know, iterating, saying like, how's this look? Is this okay? You know, have you got any questions? And, and really start to, you know, flesh out any of those, you know, bugs or nuances, getting that feedback and questions. And then we're at launch. And I think this is sometimes we, we kind of bypass this and we, we have a product and we're ready to ship it and we just, Put it out there we publish it on tableau server and, and off it goes and then we wonder why no one's looking at it or the same questions are being asked over and over again um and i think this is where we kind of like we don't really do enough marketing we don't really you know go off and sell our products out there and so when we think all the hard work is done um we're, we're sort of out, we're, we're ready for our product to go to the customers and this is you know obviously a stage where we're, we're kind of overlooking and we're not really doing that so investing the time and resources can drive value and help those partnerships so there's things like presentations you know uh building the training material walkthrough guides short videos uh hosting training sessions especially if it's like complex visualizations and com complex uh data um data being sort of like presented back to the business then there's a kind of like the iterative ongoing feedback and customer support. Um, and then the, the, the last piece is the kind of the technical documentation, you know, how does the product actually work, making sure that that's there. If the person who you know moves on, making sure that that IP is, is retained within the organization. So I know that I'm guilty of this in the past, uh, that when we've created stuff, we publish it and then we just leave it alone. Uh, and because normally there's there's high demand, you know, there's there's lots of new requests coming in. The business is eager for the next thing, and this leads to you know a saturation of products in the market. Um, Tableau Server becomes very bloated with lots of variations and very similar dashboards. Stakeholders don't really know like which one is the right one to be picking from. Uh, they're spoiled for choice, but then definitions start to change and. They could be looking at incorrect things, which then erodes the kind of trust and the reputation that has been built up. So uh, it also starts to impact the environment. You know, you think about, you know, in my previous roles as a Tableau Server Administrator, taking those backups, you know, it starts to build up in terms of how many gigabytes that a server backup can, can actually go to. Um, we've got hundreds of Tableau extracts running each day. Um, all competing for time because everyone schedules them at like eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> 
Yeah, on Monday morning, eight o'clock. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, they're all sort of bottlenecked at that time to try and get refreshed, ready for the, the business users to come in. So we start accumulating this te technical debt. This can erode business value. Um, and it could be also um, business value eroded because of we've got BI resources doing very similar things um, and having to in invest in like server upgrades and licensing and all this kind of stuff as well. So not cheap to do that kind of stuff. So this is where we kind of like start thinking of treating dashboards as, as data products. We can address some of those things. So I'm going to give you some tips about how we can use Tableau and Tableau Server to manage our portfolio of products uh, more efficiently. So the first thing is, is the question about, is it actually being used? Um, and this is kind of like for people who are just sort of publishing dashboards, you know, we've got a really simple thing here, just showing the views of all time. You know, you know when you've published it, you can actually get a sense of like, is this actually being looked at? Um, products will have a certain shelf life. Um, you know, it might be a project specific um, type dashboard. So it's going to reach a point where no one's actually looking at it anymore. Um, so if you're a creator or an explorer, you can use this metric to really quickly just see how many total views for your workbook. Um, and you can compare it to others to see its popularity um, from your content across other ones. So it's, you know, it's really quick to see like which dashboards suddenly gain that popularity and the view count suddenly jumps up. Could you use the um, last three months or last month to get a feeling on time? Yeah, so Dave's just asked a question about looking at, you can see there the views all time. There's a, um, you can change that to be like different time periods as well. So it's a really good point. So yeah, you can start to change that views all time. Oh, mouse cursor is not on there. Um, adjusting that views of all time to show a relative, relatively relative time period, um, just to sort of get a bit more clarity on those 89 views might be, you know, from over six months ago. So I might not have, you know, the, the, the recency uh, that's going on with that dashboard. If you're a site admin, this is, this is where I think there's a lot more uh, substance in these reports. Um, I think I'd, I, I'd love to raise this kind of as a, as a feedback or a product request that publishers get these type of information from the site admin reports for, for their own content, because I think that would add a, a lot of value. Um, we can see within the site admin report, so people who are site administrators, this will look, you know, they would have seen this before, but people who aren't, um, there's these pretty cool views, which I could give you way more insight in terms of like what's actually going on with content. So we've got things like uh, traffic to views, uh, we've got uh, stats for load times, which I think is probably one of the most important <laughs> important admin views out there. Uh, and there's a recent one that's come up, uh, stale content. So, you know, really highlighting what content isn't being looked at. These give way more detail and, and also trended views. So you can see the peaks and troughs and when things are starting to decline. Um, was there higher views after a demo session or was it, you know, published in an internal blog? These type of activities where people are marketing this, these type of information out there and, and driving that engagement. Um, do people know about it? You know, there's, there's obviously like tags. Uh, I don't know how many people have used the tag, tagging feature that much. 100%, like I've, I've saved my, you know, saved my skin before because doing, you know, uh, things like migration of content, um, you know, getting um, tagging items, you can then set you know, extracts to say, I only want to pick content using that tag, using, you know, different API calls and stuff like that. So tags are absolutely fantastic. Does this show up in the search? Sorry? What's that? The customer. Yes. Customer. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly the, so the main. Well. Just to alert chat, the most popular words you're going to use as tags and put that in front of the search so not create an endless new tag so you can see the so we, we actually created, uh, in my previous organization, we created like a, a list of tags. So we said that these are the tags that needed to be used um, as part of the kind of like, if you were giving it a, a license agreement, you had to um, use this kind of like uh, Tableau principles. And, and those kind of list of tags was, was uh, maintained by the, the sort of the internal team um, as the, the reference point. So there weren't spelling mistakes because there's, there's obviously case sensitivity. People don't check the spelling of things and all that kind of stuff. So you can quickly get things which, you know, get a bit messy, but if you keep an eye on that as a, 
if you're a site admin or a server, server admin, that can it can be really a, a beneficial um, activity. So uh, just a quick one, yeah, to show how tags in, you can add them. Um, you go to the dashboard, explore all workbooks, actions, and then tag. And then you can just see there's a free text field where you can add that tag in. So yeah, important to recognize what that, um, the, the, the case sensitivity and, and making sure you're consistent within what those tags are. And then you can see that I've started, I didn't you know, I've, I thought I put an image of starting to type in the tag. Um, but then you can see where the, the, the tags appear. So um, share with me, this is, I think a lot of people just kind of like take that URL and send it off to people via instant message or emails and stuff like that. The share with me option, when you click share, it gives you two things. You can share a link or you can actually share with the named user. If you share with a named user, when they log in, you can see that there's an option there saying um, what's been shared with me. And so they can just go straight there and they can have a list of, you know, all the dashboards that have been shared with them. Um, really good way to get people straight there because if, if you're, if there's a stakeholder, you can create something and you can share it with them straight away. So it's, it's always there at the top of mind. They need to log in and click on that one thing. And there's the list of dashboards that have been shared with them. So they don't have to get into Tableau server and start searching or finding emails for URLs that you've been, that they've been sent. Um, so definitely, I think, the share function is, is, is definitely underused as well. Um, and I think an important one is once you show someone how to do that, like they can then do it with up for other people as well. So it starts to like cascade and, and, and grow from there. Has anyone walked through a park and seen this before? And so essentially what it is, is a pathway that's been created by people just taking shortcuts. Um, but there's a, there's a name for this and I kind of stumbled across this, it's called desire lines. And what this means is it's an unbiased measure of how people use things. And the size represents the amount of demand for the, for, for the taking the desired over the designed path. So there's footpaths right next to it, but they've just gone up, I'm gonna go there. And it's quite a well-worn pathway. So Tableau has desire lines. I think this is cool. Um, so when you start looking at dashboards have been on the server for a while, you start to see this usage patterns that exist. And, and I kind of like ask people when they come to me and say, oh, my dashboard's running slow, it's taking ages to load. And I bring it up and the first thing I look at is saying, you've got three views here which are being used, but you've got these two other views which no one's looking at. Like, can we take them out? You know, oh, but the stakeholder requested them and they were important but clearly no one's using it. So like, why can't we take them out and, and remove that? And that will then free it. There could be additional data sources and all this kind of stuff in there. So, you know, using this as a technique to really start to, uh, you know, lighten the load of the dashboard over time. I think it's a really sort of a, a great idea where the kind of product design comes into, you know, the Tableau and we can see these usage patterns emerging. Who's seen this view? Um, this is, again, um, you can see under the actions, you can see who's seen this view and it creates a list of, of, uh, of users and how many times they've viewed it, when the last time they viewed it. Um, and so it can give you insight into the stakeholders, stakeholders who are using it. Um, did they commission the work? Um, you know, are there other people who, who have suddenly discovered it and started using it? Uh, do they understand what they're looking at? Have, have they been engaged? Have they been walked through? Um, but it also tells you who's not looking at it because you might have had stakeholders who requested the piece of work and they haven't looked at it or they haven't looked at it in months. Um, so you can work out like, you know, why aren't they using it? Ask those questions. I personally am like super frustrated when I had work commissioned by someone and I look at it and then they've not been using it. Um, so I, I use it as a chance to re-engage them and, and understand like, why aren't you using this? Like, you know, this, this is a lot of work, you know, you know, is there something wrong with it? Kind of like, you know, go from there. I think it's good to find the change champions as well, where you've got people that are using it, they have got high influencers, and that would be a popular group for people that are interested in growing the market. Yep. Really mm -hmm. awesome. So there's a picture of, uh, yeah, that you can see when you can um, bring up who's, who's seen this view. <clears throat> So uh, another thing is around um, speed matters. Um, and this is kind of like something that I've been focusing recently at, at JLL is there's research by Nielsen Norman Group 
indicating that a 10 second delay will often make users leave a site immediately. And if this is behavior from people on websites, why would it be vastly different in a work environment? You know, I mean, I guess because we're paid to be there. So, you know, you're willing to sort of wait a little bit longer, um, but there's kind of two main reasons why speed is important. Uh, one is limitations. Um, waiting impacts short-term memory and we, we start to lose attention. And there's aspirations. Human nature desires control over the outcomes. And so we, we're, we actually rather, um, we don't like being dependent on computers and, and waiting for that kind of stuff. So what they've broken down is like response time in, in 0.1 seconds, it gives us the feeling of the instantaneous response. Um, result feels caused by the user. I've clicked on something again, and this is what's been presented to me. One second delay, the thought flow is seamless, but they can sense the delay, but they still feel in control. 10 seconds, they start thinking about other things and they get it's difficult to get their brain back on track once the page responds. So this is why speed, speed is important. Um, and so how do you tell if your dashboard's too slow? Um, the first might be just direct feedback, people complaining, uh, your dashboard's too slow. Uh, so you might get this direct feedback from, from end users. Uh, there's probably gonna be comments made, um, but you can get your colleagues to test um, and, and give that kind of feedback. It's always going to be slower on Tableau Server compared to desktop. Um, but there's things that you can do, like start performance recording, um, you know, reviewing the site admin reports. As I mentioned earlier, there's the, the stats for load times. Um, you can start to benchmark what that load time is. And possibly users are disengaging because that dashboard takes too long. So using the Tableau desktop performance recorder, you can identify these events which are causing these delays and you can like work to uh, address those. So that's kind of like uh, an image of what the performance recorder looks like in terms of like telling you, this is my query is taking the longest thing to, to, um, to generate. Uh, and then you can like work down a little bit more detail in terms of like if there's specific charts which are causing these type of delays. So did you know that you can also run the performance recording on Tableau Server. So uh, this is a really cool feature. You do need the Tableau Server Administrator to enable this. And you can see there in the image, right in the bottom, there's settings as a Tableau Server Administrator. And then they click on the box, Workbook Performance Metrics. Then you can start a performance recording on Tableau Server. You it looks a bit complicated here, but essentially you take the URL of the uh, dashboard, you insert this random colon record underscore performance equals yes amp <laughs> ampersand and you insert that in between the end of the URL and before the ID. Then you click refresh. <laughs> then you interact with the dashboard as you would like as a, as a user. And then you'll see this that stockwatch um, icon there. You can see it under, under on, the, um, on the image there under performance. Yeah under business, uh, above the performance, so sorry. Like the clock in the bottom right. Oh, okay. yeah, I was looking <laughs> So you interact with the dashboard and then once you're finished, you click on that stopwatch on the, on the page and it ends the recording and then it will display the same sort of outcome. So gives you a bit more accuracy in terms of what that end user experiencing on Tableau server. Um, but that's something that I've only, I mean, I discovered it not, not too long ago, um, but I think that's another, it's a really cool way that you can get a little bit more um, understanding of like how those end users are experiencing your product. Do you have to be a server admin or can a site admin? You have to, you can, it has to be server admin to enable it, but once, once it's enabled, then anyone can do it. So even like just a normal end user of the Tableau server can, can do that, yeah. But it needs to be enabled by the server administrator to start with. Also, you shouldn't really leave it in that if there is a bit of that Depending on, yeah, depending on how many times it's, it's used and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's one of those hidden, hidden ones that <laughs> exist out there. With uh, some of the more recent releases of Tableau Desktop, um, I thought that one of the most exciting features is, is, the, um, is the new optimizer function. Um, so this is in Desktop 2022.1. I don't know how many people are on this. We are not there yet at JLL, um, but obviously I've, I've you know, been able to play with it a little bit. Um, for too long, I've witnessed dashboards being published on the servers and then people contact me saying, 
Why is it taking so long to load? Um, the optimizer just condenses a whole bunch of best practices out there and, and generates warnings for people before they go to publish. Um, and taking these actions can really improve load times. Um, and you know you can use other things like there's a lot of stuff out there. There's uh, white papers. Um, I think there's a recent one um, called Designing Efficient Workbooks in Production. 88 pages. Uh, I've actually like gone through it um, in, in a lot of detail. Um, but it's definitely sort of a bedtime reading. It's going to put you to sleep, that one. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a little, little, little point you may not be aware of. That was actually written in Australia by Alan Miller. That's the original one. And then yeah, there's been an updated sports, version. Yes, like exactly. Yep. Uh, I don't, yeah, Alan's was, was great. I like that was the kind of like sat on the desk for a long time, uh, that one. Um, so why uh, do this type of optimization? Um, we can increase product satisfaction, um, increase productivity. We can actually measure the time saved from users like loading dashboards. Um, you can attribute like how much time people are, you know, how much what their hourly rate is and then sort of like work back from that saying, I've reduced the dashboard loading from 30 seconds down to 10 seconds. And you can start to attribute, you know, that kind of like ROI from that. Um, there's also cost reduction sort of, uh, and, and, you know, incentives as well, especially when a lot of businesses start to move to the kind of whole cloud databasing paper query type models as well. So if there's like inefficiencies in terms of like how queries are being written and going straight into Tableau, you know, you can start to generate a little bit of, uh, of, of, uh, um, expensive bills um, coming from, you know, the likes of Snowflake and, and Google BigQuery. Um, so definitely the optimizer, if you haven't seen it before, when you have your dashboard, you can go up to the publish um, at the top as, as if you're going to publish. And in there, there's a as an option to say run optimizer. It will then check the best practices and you can see there, I've got like a red uh, warning, take action. Then there's another one saying needs review and then there's 14 that have kind of passed the checks type thing so it looks for things like uh very complex calculations you know flagging them up can you move them upstream to the database or alteryx or data tableau prep or whatever um maybe you know tableau is not the best place to have you know lengthy if statements and stuff like that running in there and so the last one is around archiving and, and you know, there's going to be a time where we should be asking this type of question, has the dashboard surface purpose? Um, and consider when it's time to deprecate, um, there's, there's going to be a point where there's no value being uh, obtained. This could be the end of a project, it could be a change in business objectives. Um, you know, it's, it's a good practice to set sort of these milestones, you know, every three months, six months type thing, the check in on activity begin those deprecation steps, uh, reduce the extract frequency. So then, you know, things might be updating every day. Maybe you can move that to a weekly update. Um, you know, that then frees up six less extract, extract jobs that are running uh, each week. Uh, start to send those notifications to historic users. Do you still need this? You can move it to an archive folder. Uh, a lot of this stuff can be automated as well. Um, Delete or pause the extract and subscription tasks. I've seen dashboards with huge subscription tasks that are just generating like full PDF documents of, of, a, of like a 12 page uh, dashboard. Um, these kind of jobs do impact the Tableau server. And I think a lot of users don't realize that. Um, and then, you know, actually just removing it. And I know like Gary's team do some really great stuff with taking it off the server and then putting it in a, in a GitHub repo and, and keeping it there in case the, the stakeholders do want it to bring it back at some point. Um, important to sort of not just turn it off and leave it on Tableau server, especially if it does take up a bit of size, because going back to those the, the Tableau server admin, those backup jobs, you know, they can start to build up. And, and if it does go, you know, the Tableau server does need to be restored from backup, that smaller that size, the faster that backup is going to get um, restored. So these are just kind of the few things where we can use Tableau to help frame dashboards as data products. Um, by changing the perception, we can reduce the load on our platforms. We can uh, you know, lower that impact on Tableau server and our databases. We can focus users more on a refined set of information and we can support customers with getting the insights that they need. Getting them more comfortable with the data and data products. And this means they're able to use these more, more often and, uh, and obtain the insight that they're looking for. If you're interested uh, in this top, more on this topic, I'd recommend checking out this book, uh, The Art of Innovation by Tom Keeley. 
this book is is full of great ideas. I, I love this book. Um, it I don't know if anyone's read it before or not here. Um, it's a guy from uh, a design agency called IDEO. Um, they're quite a, um, they're well recognized in the US, um, but there's great ideas about how to foster an environment of collaboration, ideas and other methods related to product design. Um, and these can definitely be uh, adopted and, and taken to the world of, of BI and data. More related to data visualization and Tableau, um, David Perez, who's, who's based in London, he has some really good ideas on, on this topic as well. Um, and uh, he explores design thinking methods and, and how we can improve uh, the way that we build visualization products as well. So he's got a blog post out there as well called Rethinking Data Visualizations. I'm excited about how BI and data um, is, is merging into the product space. Um, and I think it's an exciting time. And it gives a bit more credit, credibility to what we do um, and for all the companies that we work for. So thank you for listening. Thanks, Chris. I'll enjoy the present. I've learned so many things. Do we have any questions? And uh, it sounds weird to just leaning over the microphone. Do you have any questions in the in a virtual room? I was watching the chat and a lot of people enjoy them. All of them enjoy the presentation. But do you want to get close? Yeah. Please? <laughs> I know that JLL put a lot of effort into design thinking. Yeah. I'm really interested in what you guys are doing in that space. I'm not how, probably how the best that, qualified to talk about because Fiona. To designing a dashboard. <laughs> yeah, well, there is a lot of um, effort put into that. I don't know, Gary, you can probably share because you were in, probably more closely involved with uh, with Fiona and when that was all done. Yeah, we've been there for a long time. So we sort of break things down into two parts, obviously doing the right things and then doing things right. And I think what we've spoken about today is really doing things right and a lot of the development side of things. Um, but doing the right things is really our design thinking principles. So we actually run our workshops, we understand the pain points in the business and really relating what we do back to the, you know, the value creation stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, gain a lot of empathy with the, with the users and, and really putting them under a bit of pressure to come up and really articulate quickly what their, their challenges are. Um, so it's a pretty fun activity and it's still something that um, yeah, sharpens our focus when it comes to, to designing. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. You're welcome to come along anytime you like. Especially you're just across the road as well. well <laughs> can we all come? These guys are just over the road. So. <laughs> Any questions from the Zoomers? Comments, thoughts? Any questions from the room? No? So thanks, thanks again, Chris. I think that was no um, problems. Amazing. Um, and I guess- Just we, confirming, can you see? Yeah, we see your screen now. So Perfect. we'll hear you clear as well. Okay, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, yeah, and I'm going yeah. to hear us as well. Okay. Someone. Yeah, no worries. Um, I can't see the screen. So if anyone has any questions, just come off mute and ask the question. Um, awesome, thank you so much for having me. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, but a little bit about me to start off with. Um, so my name is Prina. I am currently the product owner for CRM analytics at uh, Telstra Enterprise. Um, I have worked across a number of different organizations. Um, uh, you can see on the left-hand side, I kind of, mainly started off at Rio Tinto and then over the years just worked through a couple of um, different industries. I've um, never actually worked in the same industry twice. Um, I love getting a lot of different experience. Um, and within those industries, I actually worked in a lot of different teams as well. So everything from sort of sales, procurement, HR, marketing. Um, but one thing I had in common across all of those was I've always worked with uh, data and analytics. Um, always usually landed in the analytics, uh, visual analytics space, um, worked across a lot of different platforms. I have worked with Tableau um, quite a while ago, actually, back when I was with Rio Tinto um, and started working with CRMA when it was Wave, um, so back in 2009. Um, I, as Frederick and Caroline mentioned, I am currently a Tableau ambassador for CRMA. So I did start in the Salesforce Analytics Champions program. Um, and then obviously with all of the changes um, and all the name changes as well, um, moved across into the Tableau ambassador program. Um, outside of work, uh, a bit about me, I am from New Zealand. Um, so born in Wellington, moved over here when I was quite young and have lived most of my life in Brisbane. 
Um, I did also work for a year in Singapore. So that was when I was pre Tinto. I stood up their sales and marketing um, and analytics office over there. Um, outside of that, uh, my life kind of revolves around my dog, as most of you earlier in the call may have seen. She's very demanding and loves attention. Um, and a bit of a shameful plug here, but my husband and I recently opened a bar. Well, it's a taproom nanobrewery and cafe. So if you're around the north side, it's um, in Brendel. And that picture there is actually a beer that I learned to brew. So it's a um, strawberry shortcake biscuit ale. Uh, so moving into what I'm going to talk about. So with CRM analytics, um, I'm going to start talking about contextual and actionable insights. Um, so what is that? Uh, when we talk about insights, uh, contextual insights, it's usually around um, insights that we embed in an object, so Salesforce objects that our users are working in. Um, they're insights which allow our teams to proactively manage their customers and um, obviously coming from a Telstra enterprise space, uh, a lot of our sales teams look after multiple customers and big customers as well. Um, we always like to try and make the usability of what um, our teams are doing a lot easier. So we reduce that swivel chair and multiple clicks um, when we look at contextual insights. Um, and then from the actionable perspective, it's you've got the insights in front of you, it's where you're working. And then we want you to be able to take an action from exactly what you're seeing um, and also collaborate with your peers. Um, and when I say peers, I mean, we're, we look at it from a sales perspective, but that could be collaborating with others in marketing. It could be service. Um, or other peers in your sales team as well. Um, so just a little bit about CRMA, I'm not sure how many people um, know a lot about it. So really high level, um, obviously it sits um, alongside the Salesforce platform. Um, and when you actually dive in, you start at the data perspective and obviously being native to Salesforce, you have access directly to all of the Salesforce objects and fields, um, but we do also bring in a lot of external data. Um, so for example, at Salesforce, we did use the Informatica connector and connect to all of um, the multiple legacy systems um, that Telstra has. Uh, so once we've got sort of that data being ingested, um, we then look at it from a data flow and recipe perspective, um, and obviously moving more into recipes as well. Um, so a couple of things that you can do with the data, uh, edge mart, digest, transform. And when I talk about transform, you can, a couple of the things that we look at is flatten sentiment detection, um, time series forecasting. Um, you can aggregate it, uh, Einstein discovery, um, the predictive and AI models. So you can actually do that all within when you're building out, <coughs> sorry, when you're building out your data set. Um, and then once you've got that, you've scheduled it and monitor it um, quite frequently. So once we have our data set, they end up in an app um, and think of an app sort of like a folder um, where we can set security and sharing rules on that app. Um, and Salesforce or uh, actually give you the option to create out of the box apps as well that already come with um, data sets uh, created and then templated dashboards as well with those data sets um, using the Salesforce data that it connects to. Um, from that data, we then go ahead and start exploring um, what you've created through a lens. So look at a lens as a building block um, to then end up in a dashboard. Um, and then from the dashboard, um, similar to what you know, how we work across Tableau, you've got widgets, um, as I mentioned, the templates as well. Um, and then the more um, detailed language, the SACL language that we get in and create um, a lot of the queries that we use. Um, and then from there, we share those dashboards. So um, either the analytics tab in Salesforce, um, we share through community, which is now called experiences. So that's where, um, for example, within Telstra, we share with a lot of um, our partners. Um, we get to pick the security on how we share that. Um, and the part I'm actually gonna talk through today is where we embed it. So we embed those dashboards right into the objects where our users are working. So I didn't wanna do a live demo because we all know how live demos go. So I've done a video and I am hoping that it plays okay. There is no sound, so I'm actually gonna talk to it um, as it plays through. So I'll stop it in case it um, gets too quick and I'm still talking. Cool, so from Salesforce, um, our sales teams head into their account page. Um, and the first thing that pops up in front of them is this insights tab. Um, and as I said, it's contextual insights. It's all around pointing out what's happening with that customer. 
um, that they're looking at. So covering things like the health and NPS, um, the contracts, um, as you can see, we call that there, we turn it red, that's how many that are expiring soon. We then look at the activities that we've got there and we can see that there's overdue activities. So being able to hover over that number and get a view of what are those actual activities um, and what are the days um, that they are currently overdue. Um, and so it's giving you a little bit more information, but with then the option to drive into a secondary, more detailed dashboard. Um, and then in this view, we have the table view. Um, and from here is where I was saying that we can take actions directly from that dashboard. So for that activity there, going in and changing the due date on that and pushing it out as that meeting is rescheduled. So saving that actually goes and updates that task object um, in Salesforce. So we then have something similar with cases. Um, so we look at our service cases for our customer. We can see that there's two in progress there. And again, hovering over that little segment of that chart gives you the option to view what case that actually is. Um, and sorry, that kind of glitched a bit there, but again, diving into a secondary dashboard that sits right behind that, all still within that account page as well. Um, but giving the, the user more insights and more metrics that relate to what is happening with their customer cases. Um, and again, with the table view, being able to actually let our users take actions right from that dashboard, um, creating a new task. And so on the right-hand side, just behind this little pop-up screen, you can see a list of all these tasks here. And that's where the tasks that um, I'm creating on that screen now will actually land. And so then that will also show up in the activity dashboard and the activity um, metrics that we saw on that first page as well. Um, and then the last part of that around opportunities. So what's our pipeline for our customer? What's happening with them? Um, we go in and we look at um, you know, the values. And again, being able to either um, create a post, log a call. Um, you can also open that record directly, which opens it into a second tab. Um, and so then you can dive straight into that record and start working on it as well. Um, so yeah, that is pretty much the demo and just sort of a really quick overview of where we were looking at with what's happening with embedding um, our dashboards, giving our users contextual and actionable insights right within the Salesforce platform of where they're working. Um, and I will, I have sent this slide uh, deck through to Fred as well. So um, there are some links in here that I've added if anyone's uh, interested about learning a little bit more about CRMA, um, but of course, reach out to me on LinkedIn as well, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Um, so I will stop the share so I can see everyone, but were there any questions? Thanks, Prina. Any questions from the room? The rooms? Yeah, Dave, Frank, speak. Frank, I'm just interested. Uh, there's sort of a bit of an overlap there between using CRM analytics or, or Salesforce analytics and Tableau, Tableau as a replacement for it. Where, where do you see things? Have you played much with Tableau in Salesforce? And um, I haven't actually. So I um, I know there is another team within Telstra who use Tableau. However, it's not integrated into Salesforce as yet. So predominantly from an analytics view and where we see our teams using Salesforce, we do use Einstein or CRMA dashboards. Um, so right now um, for where we're working across our marketing sales service teams, we have about 40 dashboards that we've embedded um, within the Salesforce platform and also the partners community as well. But I'd definitely be interested in seeing how Tableau integrates into Salesforce and how that looks. So if anyone's done that, it'd be great to see some examples of it. Uh, there's someone in the room that- Oh, awesome. Not naming names. <laughs> Is our next volunteer for next time? <laughs> yeah, I think so. That'd be good to see. Yeah, thanks, Pina. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> great. That's a good question. I got my next presenter now, next year. <laughs> <laughs> any any more questions or comments? I enjoyed the demo. Or the, yeah, that was a good demo. It didn't crash, which was good. Any more questions or comments from the room? I think um, not question but comment. And I think like I think a lot of other um, software companies are going down this route where you're seeing a lot of 
visuals inside embedded within these applications, which then you know you, you're not sort of like having to be on different systems and stuff like that, and trying to incorporate everything together. Uh, and I think, like, I don't, I think Power BI wants to do it. I know we're not meant to say that in this room, but uh, uh, I've heard, heard, heard some things that they do some really augmented stuff as well. So, you know, using apps and stuff like that. But it's, it's interesting to see the, the investment um, in this type of, uh, I guess, user experience from, yeah. from a lot of software companies. I think Tablet do it as well for, with the extensions because we kind of go the other way. We, we put the, um, you know, the, the interface within an extension, within a React app, for example, and allow people to um, you know, work on something you know, downstream of the dashboard via the app and interact with the data. Whereas, you know, what we're seeing is kind of the other way around, right? We've got the app and that's interacting here on the visualization and you can, you can you know, achieve a similar sort of outcome, but it did seem like mm. pretty, all-rounded product. Uh, I would like to see the Tableau dashboards in there. I think you're yeah, looking at the dashboards, uh, you know, I mean, listen to the next user group. Improvements for those users. But um, look, it was great. Thanks for that. It's really, really interesting. Mm, thanks. I think that there is one thing that is really relevant about using Tableau dashboards, um, especially in Salesforce, is the ability that they have to actually inherit the hierarchies, profiles that you use there. In, I mean, you can embed Power BI through a visual force into Salesforce, but it's not quite recommended, um, especially because it doesn't inherit profiles or hierarchies and you have to create some visual force for specific profiles and stuff. So in a functional level, it's not recommended, although you can do it. Um, I think that the, what you can do with embedding Tableau through the Lightning connector into a platform like Salesforce allows you to interact and allows C-level executives to actually enjoy that journey better than um, regular admins or standard users. So if you, I would say, I would recommend that if you want to engage C-level executives quickly, embed a Tableau dashboard into your platform so that they can actually enjoy the ride. It's, it's really, really simple. Keep some of your, your content as well. Don't waste all your content <laughs> for, for your presentation. Well, well my number is. <laughs> The other thing that many is showing up about there is it's actually using some of the strengths we know about Tableau natively. So we can build our visualizations to suit the business question that we're trying to answer. And you can have it based on the Salesforce data. So whether, whether it's a case of I've built this visualization, I've got a scatter diagram, there's an outlier out here, I want to understand what that is. And if it's an opportunity or a lead or a customer, it doesn't matter. You've got the lead ID, the customer ID, the opportunity ID. And we can click on it and open up a Salesforce ready to edit page based on that outlier. Yeah. It just makes it so quick and easy. Do you realize we're talking more about Salesforce than Tableau in the Tableau? That's scary, isn't it? Is someone recording that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Fran, you're probably in the different Salesforce user groups as well. We'd, we'd be very keen on uh, getting in and helping you guys with understanding what Tableau is as well. Yeah, of course. I actually co-lead the Brisbane Salesforce user group. We so um, we do have a meeting next week, but we've got a local ISV who's coming to talk to us about what they do um, from the ISV space. Um, yeah. But yeah, we're on LinkedIn. We've put all of our meetings up there, so it'll be great. And I'll, um, yeah, I'm really definitely interested to see the next Tableau user group. So that's something that'll be quite cool. But just listening to a couple of things that you were talking about there, um, we've definitely feel that our users benefit more from having the dashboards embedded where they're working. I think you see an uptake of that and you see it from a higher level as well, right through to the end users um, who are in those individual cases or accounts. Well, the other thing, just building on that point, Tableau has now for probably the last five years been building on APIs specifically with that intent. Mm. So there's something like about 11 APIs about it's crazy the number and they're all built for different use cases so that um, it's easy to build them into that inline stay in the flow mm. sort of thing yeah i just saw the uh, message from marco in the chat um, just asking whether the visualization that was presented was built from the ground up or built from pre-existing components um, i built that little demo dashboard in about 10 minutes today <laughs> so that was um that was from scratch just using some demo data and um 
just bringing I, the data set I didn't do. Um, that was just an uploaded Excel spreadsheet. Um, but once I had that data set, it was just about bringing all of the different elements um, onto the page. Cool. So Prina, I'm going to share the, the link after the meeting. I use your follow up and share the, the, yeah, the YouTube recording and I can share your, your user group as well. So That's if good. you're interested, then we can sort of, since we're part of the same family, trailblazers and data farm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's good. I really enjoyed it. I think everybody enjoyed your, your preso as well. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Um, so for people in the room, we've got a lucky door prize or lucky chair prize. You need to check on the, the chair. There's a sign that says you want something and I've got some tableau thing, swag, I think it's called. So just go around your, your chairs and see if you, if you, so. Otherwise, we I don't know, maybe check on this one. Uh, so for, for people that join us virtually, thanks for joining us. I hope you'll be able to join next time in, in the city. Yeah. So Sam, I'm a little bit disappointed I'm not there now. As you can see from behind me, I do love a bit of swag. <laughs> Someone won the prize. <laughs> um, so, and so, yeah, so thanks, Chris. Thanks, Prina. I think with that presenters, there will be any talks. So it's always good to share ideas and experiences. So thanks again. Um, I appreciate that. If people are in the room virtually or in the room, if if you feel like presenting, looks like we've got one presenter. <laughs> Say hello to the camera, honey. Uh, but we usually meet every couple of months. So next time you all be invited. Thanks again and uh, see you online somewhere. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye.